Good afternoon uh, to our audience who is tuning in online to watch this, as well to those who are here today at CSIS. I'm Charles E. Dell, the Australia Chair and a Senior Advisor here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, the Australia Chair, which was generously endowed by Pratt Industries, is ded dedicated to increasing mutual understanding between the United States and Australia and serving as an independent platform to pursue policies that help advance, deepen, and broaden the bilateral alliance. Uh, today, we were lucky enough to host here at CSIS our first American-Australian Indo-Pacific Strategic Dialogue. Uh, the conference brought together key stakeholders, uh, decision makers, and strategic thinkers from both countries as we pursued ideas to advance both how Washington and Canberra can work together to facilitate a more prosperous and more secure future for both of us. I want to sincerely thank all of our conference participants for participating, many of whom are in the room with us, and your thoughtful comments really helped us in thinking about what are the future moves that we need to pursue together. Now, I'm very excited to say that concluding this conference, it's my great pleasure to welcome the Honorable Christopher Bowen, who is making his first trip to the United States in his new role as Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Minister Bowen is here having just flown in from Pittsburgh, where he participated in the Clean, Global Clean Energy Action Forum. The timing for today's conversation on securing a clean and secure energy future for the Indo-Pacific is auspicious, as both Australia and the United States have recently passed major climate legislation. But if the timing is auspicious, it's also critical, given what's at stake for both of our countries for the region and indeed for our entire planet. To that end, Australia's new government is moving climate policy to center stage in both how it approaches its domestic and its foreign policies. We're delighted to host Mr. Bowen here at CSIS today, who will lay out how the new Australian government plans on doing just that. The Honorable Chris Bowen, as I said, is Minister for Climate Change and Energy. He is also the federal member for McMahon in New South Wales. Mr. Bowen grew up in Smithfield in Western Sydney, and after serving as mayor of Fairfield, entered the federal parliament in 2004. He's held a wide range of portfolios, including serving as treasurer, minister for human services, minister for immigration, and minister for small businesses. He lives in Smith Smithfield, excuse me, with his wife, Rebecca, with his children, Grace and Max, and of course, last but not least, with your Labradors, Ollie and Toby. Uh, it's a great honor to have him here with us today, and I'd like to invite him to discuss opportunities for U.S.-Australian collaboration to deliver a clean and secure energy future for the Indo-Pacific region. Minister Bowen. Well, thank you, Charles, for that welcome, and uh, thank you for the honor of uh, addressing a body as distinguished as the CSIS this afternoon. Of course, in Australia, we have developed in recent years the practice of recognising and honouring the traditional owners of the lands on which we gather as an act of inclusion and respect. I live in Western Sydney, as Charles said, which is the land of the Gabrigal people of the Darug Nation, and I pay my respects to them and pay my respects to all Indigenous Australian people, wherever they are, and of course, uh, pay my respects in that vein uh, to the Piscataway and the Nakatachan people, the First Nations people, traditional owners of Washington, D.C. I also want to acknowledge you, Charles, and the creation of your important role as chair, Australia Chair and acknowledge uh, Anthony Pratt's generosity and, of course, uh, acknowledge the Ambassador, uh, Arthur Sinodin, is here today. Uh, the appointment of the uh, Chair is, I think, a very important and positive step, recognising the importance of the Indo-Pacific, of course, and the importance of the relationship uh, between the United States and Australia within uh, the Indo-Pacific. And I'm sure Charles will give you plenty of content to work with over the next few years. Well, today's function is the last uh, of my trip to the United States, uh, which began with the United Nations General Assembly in New York and included, as Charles said, the productive clean energy ministerial in Pittsburgh. And there has been a real sense of productive urgency in the air this week in all the forums I've been involved in, as, as indeed there should be. It's that urgency that I want to focus my remarks on today. The urgent need to reduce emissions this decade and the urgent need to secure our supply chains as we do so. 
This is in keeping with your theme today of your conference, a clean and secure energy future in the Indo-Pacific. We have less than a decade to ensure we keep the world as close as possible to 1.5 degrees of warming. Every one-tenth of one degree above 1.5 degrees has serious implications for our health and the health of our planet. And of course, has serious implications for the security of our region as well, whether we look at the world's largest archipelago in Indonesia or the impact on our uh, Pacific Island family. Uh, there are real implications for every small degree of warming over 1.5 degrees. And of course, the other element of urgency is supply chains. When I think about the possible impediments to achieving Australia's ambition to reduce emissions by 43% and move our electricity grid to 82% renewables by 2030, there are two things which spring to mind. Labour shortages and supply chain constraints. And cooperation between like-minded countries on supply chains will be key to achieving our respective ambitions. And this has been a very large focus of all my discussions this week with Secretary Granholm, with uh, Secretary uh, Kerry, uh, with energy ministers from around the world. In both our countries, years, and indeed decades, have been wasted. Wasted arguing about whether climate change is real. Wasted scaring workers that action on climate change would come at the cost of their jobs. When all the while, the sooner we started the transition, the smoother the journey would have been. But that is what it is, that's the past behind us. It took us decades to get here, but now the task can be broken down to months. 2030 is 87 months away. Next week it'll be 86 months away. The United States has 87 months to reduce its emissions by 50% on 2005 levels. Australia has 87 months to move its electricity system to 82% renewables and to meet our economy-wide target. The world has 87 months to take the actions to hold our temperature rise to as close as possible to 1.5 degrees. Friends, 87 months isn't long. We need to unleash billions of dollars of public and private investment necessary to achieve this task in this timeline. Now, the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States and the Climate Change Act in Australia within weeks of each other show how closely our countries are now aligned. But both the Biden administration and the Albanese government are of one mind. This is not the end of the task. It is barely the end of the beginning. Environmental success must mean economic success as well. The climate policies of our government in Australia have been modelled to create 604,000 jobs in Australia over the next decade. Carmichael Roberts from the Breakthrough Energy Ventures has said that up to 1,000 companies will be created by the Inflation Reduction Act for the unleashing of the entrepreneurial spirit and venture capital, which has been crying out for leadership like that we have seen from the Biden administration. As big as the economic dividend is, and it is enormous, we should also be honest about the size of the task confronting us and the possible impediments, allowing us to focus uh, our efforts to deal with those impediments in a very honest way. Which brings me to the issue of energy security and supply chains. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic and the impacts of Russia's illegal and immoral invasion of Ukraine expose deep vulnerabilities in the global supply chains. The war in Ukraine has had devastating impacts on energy security, with much of Europe held captive over the supply of oil and gas from Russia. We've seen how this European energy supply crisis has cascaded across the world, even to some degree reaching the shores of Australia. The current challenges highlight the flaws in energy security of, overly reliant, of being over-reliant on a concentrated fossil fuel supply chain. By contrast, renewable energy has inbuilt security advantages, if properly managed. The one supply chain that no global geopolitical crisis can disrupt is the supply of sunlight to our land and the supply of wind to our country's coasts and hills. As long as we have the infrastructure established to capture, convert and store that energy. That's why we will have to support the global phase down of fossil fuels with investment in clean energy technologies and resilient and diverse supply chains. This is the best way to protect our economies from the shocks of the next crisis. Good climate policy is good economic policy is good energy security policy. As I said, let's be straight about the task that we all face. We face a collective endeavour that is almost of unprecedented scale. We need to mine, move and manufacture immense volumes of material, energy and equipment. We need to train and mobilise hundreds of thousands of skilled blue and white collar workers to fill new good quality jobs. 
For example, to achieve Australia's emission reduction target of 43 per cent by 2030, it's been estimated that we will need to install about 40 7 megawatt wind turbines every month until 2030. For solar, while Australia is already a global leader in deployment, we will need to install more than 22,500 watt panels every day and over 60 million by 2030. Now I know other countries in our region have similar ambitions. India, for example, expects to double its installed capacity by 2030 to over 800 gigawatts with a target of 50% of that capacity coming from renewable energy sources. By one estimate, Australia will require 34 times the current amount of utility scale variable renewable energy in our national electricity market to meet our green hydrogen export ambitions. We're under no illusion that meeting our 43% target in the next 87 months will require dogged efforts. We'll do it, but it's a big task and calls for an industrialising drive that takes in value adding capabilities. Right now, the stark reality is that we have an urgent need for action. A significant amount of investment, global competition for finite manufacturing components coupled with clear vulnerabilities in the supply chain. Today, more than 80% of our solar PV production is concentrated in one country. This is expected to reach over 95% in a very short time frame. I reckon that meets any definition of a monopoly. And in the context of a global energy system, that needs to decarbonise the potential risk to energy security the world over is significant. It's a similar story with lithium batteries, with electrolysers used to produce hydrogen, and the list goes on. The simple truth is that no one country can produce enough clean energy inputs to meet global need. Even if we were comfortable with the level of concentration in the supply chain, the stark fact is that current production won't be enough to meet future demands on the path to net zero. To achieve net zero, we all need to be producing the components to get us there, more reliable supply chains and more supply chains in total. I know you heard this morning from Amanda Lacaze about the instrumental role her company has played in diversifying rare earth supply chains, key ingredients for the magnets in EV motors and wind turbines. Japan, the United States and Australia have played an important role in supporting this change. But we need to diversify the clean energy supply chain even more for energy transition. I think there are two important principles underpinning the need for Australia, the United States and other like-minded countries to focus on renewable energy supply chains. Firstly, reliability. It's in America's best interest for Australia to be developing renewable manufacturing capacity and vice versa because we represent a reliable and secure supply chain for each other. Our minerals will be essential, but I want to be very clear. Australia must be more than a quarry. We need to add value, make things, and expand our place in global value chains. Secondly, these must be ethical supply chains. Moving to a renewable economy is a moral imperative as well as an economic opportunity, but we have to ensure that this transition itself is conducted in as ethical way as possible. It's much easier to assert and verify, for example, that there is no child labour or unethical labour practices used in the value add of Australian lithium or cobalt than it would be other potential sources from around the world. The rapid scale-up of production required should not be used to mask unethical labour practices, and I'm, this is a shared responsibility for all of us. Now, while this task is enormous, of course, so are the opportunities. I'm fond of saying that the world's climate emergency is Australia's jobs opportunity. Because I know that while concepts like GDP and billions of dollars invested are important, what really makes a difference to ordinary people's lives is their standard of living, and particularly good, well-paying, secure jobs. Addressing climate change is not only an opportunity for more jobs, it represents an obligation to ensure that those jobs pay decent wages, have good conditions, and deliver better lives for ordinary workers. The best way to counter the, na the naysayers who still call for delay and denial is to demonstrate that working people stand to benefit from action. That's why our government takes the view that the economy needs to work for people and not the other way around. And that's true of the transformation of our economies to address climate change as much as it is for any other area. Now, of course, already Australia and the US share a deep commitment to addressing these issues. In July, Secretary Granholm and I signed the Australia-US Net Zero Technology Acceleration Partnership. The partnership will accelerate the development and deployment of zero emissions technology, including long duration energy storage, digital electricity grids, and technology to integrate variable renewable energy, hydrogen, and direct air capture. And just this week, Secretary Granholm and I have met to map out the current situation and the future steps to implement that 
uh, very important partnership. The partnership is a commitment to make climate change a centrepiece of our alliance with the US, as Prime Minister Albanese suggested in the days after his election. But it also recognises the need to work together to overcome the immediate energy security and supply chain challenges and build resilience into the future. This week, I also signed a letter of intent on the Clean Energy Demand Initiative uh, with John Kerry in Pittsburgh, in recognition that the public and private sectors must work together to achieve shared climate and energy related goals. The Clean Energy Demand Initiative to increase transparency for investors and link companies with, co with countries, sending a message that Australia is open for business and a reliable investment partner. And I'm very pleased that Apple, Johnson & Johnson, Google and Amazon are some of the US companies that have expressed interest in investing in Australia's clean energy generation infrastructure and it's estimated they could invest up to $2.9 billion to increase renewable deployment. Supply chain discussions did also dominate the first ever meeting of the Quad Energy Ministers that I had the honour of chairing in July in Sydney and were no, no doubt figure heavily in further Quad Energy Ministers' discussions. Now allow me just to finish with some observations on the Indo-Pacific which you've spent so much time uh, talking about over the last day or so. As you've pointed out, there's a growing need for technological expertise in the Indo-Pacific countries to support the transition. It makes good economic and climate sense for us all to support our countries on this journey. The fastest growing region in the world, 60% of global energy supply, more than half of the world's energy consumption and emissions. Failure to engage in the Indo-Pacific will lead to failure to achieve global net zero. These are some of the countries, of course, also most impacted by climate change and the increasing frequency of natural disasters as we've seen all too often in recent times. But these are also some of the countries that have shown the most leadership in fighting for more global action on climate change because they're seeing the real world impacts on their communities and their livelihoods. Now, we're already working closely with our Pacific family to build their technological capability and support their energy transformation and will con continue to do so. And again, uh, options to improve that have been on the agenda this week. We're also working with regional partners like Japan, Korea and Singapore to catalyse and scale up new energy trade in renewable energy. And in this discussion about the path forward on energy security, I re reiterate once again that the Indo-Pacific needs to be the heart of any global conversations. It was earlier this month when I was in Bali to attend the G20 Energy Transition Ministerial Meeting. It was an opportunity for us to support the Indonesian G20 Presidency, which, which secured some important outcomes through the Bali uh, Statement on, on uh, sustainable energy transitions. I held bilateral uh, meetings, of course, with my Indo Indonesian counterpart, which was the first of what we've agreed will be an annual Indonesia-Australia energy dialogue. And we'll increase our support for our Pacific partners, including through a new Pacific Climate Infrastructure Financing Partnership to back climate-related infrastructure and energy projects in Pacific countries and in Timor-Leste. And I think there's scope for Australia and the United States to partner in this endeavour as well going forward. Australia sees this not only as an opportunity but as a responsibility as a key member in the Pacific and as a trusted partner to build up and build new resilient global supply chains. So friends, during the last century, Australians and Americans saw the need to collaborate militarily and commercially. They came together to build some of the, Australia's first oil and gas supply chains, which was the right thing to do for the times. These are powered industry and transport in Australia and overseas for decades. And today, our two nations are working together to develop the 21st century's equivalent, the equivalent energy industries by tapping the sun, the wind, and other renewable and clean energy sources to power our economies and to help achieve our climate ambitions, to deliver new job opportunities and improve the lives of working people, to ensure energy security for the Indo-Pacific region, because supply, policy, and investment will only go so far if we don't have a secure reliable supply chain underpinning that transformation. The climate emergency is an economic opportunity waiting to be seized. And we look forward to working in partnership with the United States to accelerate the greatest economic transformation in modern history in any of our countries, not just for our individual nations, but for our region and for the benefit of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Bowen. Uh, you said urgency uh, was the watchword uh, for your speech, but I think we can all say this, that ambition is another one too, uh, for Australia, but also for our partnership together. 
so here's how we're going to do it. There are a lot of questions now that we have about uh, recent legislation uh, that you've passed in Australia, about potential collaborations, about what this means for the region, and from an economic perspective, uh, what this means as we work together and with our own businesses. So uh, I'll put your th you through your paces as best as I can, uh, but I want to get off the stage as quickly as possible to open the conversation up to our distinguished uh, guests who are here too. So if you don't mind, I'd like to just start with what you had alluded to, uh, the fact that uh, we had dual legislation passed in the United States uh, and just weeks ago in Australia. And I was hoping uh, for an American audience, uh, you could give us a little bit of a scope uh, for what is in the scale, uh, how large is the scale and the scope of what the government has just passed, what does it require from government, and what are the next steps to implementing it? So, so uh, you, it is important and, and symbolic uh, and ideal that we both pass the legislation within weeks of each other, but they are actually quite different pieces of legislation suitable for our own needs. In our, in our case, ours is the framework. It's not the big investment that's in the Inflation Reduction Act. It's setting the framework. Really, our legislation is about the message it sends to the private sector rather than what it does for government, although there are things for government in there. So just briefly, Charles, what it does is enshrine in law our targets, 43 per cent emission reduction and net zero. That's important because it sends the message that these are the targets which are here to stay. And it, the Prime Minister and I had already notified the UNFCCC of the new targets, but we've now enshrined them in law. That's really important. Every, everywhere I go, every business tells me we want certainty. Uh, and we provide that certainty by changing the law. And it's hard to legislate, but it's even harder to repeal. Um, in both countries, I think it's fair to say. Secondly, uh, we bring the Climate Change Authority in as the independent advice mechanism for government. Governments will make, cabinets will make decisions on future targets, but will be advised by the Climate Change Authority. And if the Climate Change Authority gives me, as the Minister of the Day, or, my, or future ministers advice, which we don't accept, we have to explain why. That's a really transparent process. Uh, I uh, and future ministers have to report annually to Parliament on progress in achieving uh, the targets. Um, so it's really about that framework and that, that message it sends. We're open for business. Uh, we've got one set of policies. They won't change. We've had too much chopping and changing of energy policies. Now we have one framework. Now, within that, of course, we have a range of policies which we're getting on with, which the legislation, if you like, requires us because we've got to achieve the emissions reduction. Um, so then we have rewiring the nation, which is our policy to build 10,000 kilometres of transmission wires across our country because renewable energy is spread across the country. Unlike coal and gas, which tends to be clustered in geographic locations, re renewable energy is everywhere, which means you do need to upgrade the grid. It's a massive task and opportunity. Safeguards mechanism, which is our mechanism to reduce safe, uh, emissions from our 215 biggest emitters. Um, and a whole bunch of others, community batteries, electric vehicle uh, strategy, a whole bunch of others, but they're the policies that we've already laid out and are getting on with. Uh, terrific. You know, you talked about this as an economic opportunity uh, for Australia, but traditionally, uh, Australia has fueled its economic growth based on mining, based on energy sectors, and we're talking about, as you characterize it, a fairly radical uh, transition to a new source or sources of energy. And as we grapple with this challenge ourselves as well, uh, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about steps that the government is thinking about to mitigate uh, and cushion that transition for workers themselves. Well, I mean, as you said, there's a, this is a massive change, but it's not at the end of mining. We'll be mining more. We'll be mining more things. Uh, we need to do that. There are different places is the transition and, and that you refer to. Um, I guess a couple of things, Charles. Firstly, our policies create a lot of jobs, and they create them in the regions. Five out of six of those 604,000 jobs I refer to are in the regions. And by and large, they're in the regions which are energy regions, because the regions that have powered Australia for so long will continue to power us, because they have a number of advantages. They have the room. One thing that renewable energy needs is space. Apart from solar panels on the roof, you can't do it in the cities. You've got to do it in the regions. They have the grid, that's where the grid is strongest, although we've got to upgrade the grid. Where the grid is strongest, where there's the most transmission infrastructure, is the areas where there have been coal and gas plants because the infrastructure has been built to transfer the energy. So that makes sense to put more renewable energy there. That creates jobs. And importantly, they have the skills. You know, if you're an energy worker, 
you have the skills we need and we're going to need a lot more of them. Even if you're a traditional energy worker in a coal and gas fired power station, those skills are, are quite necessary, of course, with some additions and some training, etc., in the new jobs. It's a myth that there's no jobs in renewable energy. There are a lot. They're not all at the source where the energy is created. They come in the management, in the storage, in the transmission, hence the 604,000 jobs. And then the jobs created by lower energy prices because renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy and then that helps us lead that renaissance of manufacturing we want to see in Australia with a particular focus on manufacturing of renewables themselves. Um, then, then in addition, you know, there can be infrastructure around uh, you know, architectural in infrastructure in terms of government um, design around assisting those communities and we'll, we'll continue to work on that as well. Well, you just said that there are many more things to mine and dig, and part of those, as you discussed in your talk, was critical and rare earth uh, materials. In fact, uh, the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Madeline King, just said, Australia has the potential to become a major global supplier of critical minerals and rare earths, which will be essential to help Australia and the world transition to low emissions technology and achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Um, can you talk a little bit about the development plan of critical minerals, how this is going to be pursued and extracted in a climate-friendly way? Well, I mean, um, uh, obviously, this is where the private sector comes into its own. The government isn't going to do this, uh, but we will provide what we're doing is providing a certain policy framework and stability for it to do so, and we'll, we'll work very closely with any minerals, you know, critical minerals and rare earths company um, wanting to develop more in Australia, and we will ensure a smoother passage with all the necessary you know, environmental protections and safeguards in place, we would seek to smooth uh, the passage as much as possible. And uh, as I said before, also, I think the, the economy changes. We w I think the economy of, of a, of a uh, rare earths and critical minerals um, development phase means that it encourages its extraction and encourages more value adding in Australia, which in turn encourages more extraction. Um, and so therefore we have the National Reconstruction Fund, $15 billion, of which up to $3 billion is for renewable related uh, investments, the Power in the Regions Fund, all this can go to assist in that development. So, I mean, um, really what Madeline and I and Ed Husick, uh, the three uh, relevant, most relevant ministers with Don Farrell, the Trade Minister, would say is, you know, come and talk to us and let's get cracking. Let's get cracking means let's get going, just okay. to translate that into American. Okay. Um, you know, when we're talking about uh, transitioning to one of the reasons that this has been front and centre in Australian politics, I, I take you, uh, your words at the outset, that there's been a decade of debate and now the page has seemingly turned. And the page, at least uh, from my mind, when we were living in Australia, seemed to turn with the bushfires uh, starting in 2019, uh, changing the national conversation there. And uh, we've now seen a consensus building politically uh, for that. And uh, when we think about preventing extreme climate events, that has effect both in Australia, but also beyond Australia too. And I, I'd be a little bit curious as we begin to transition to the broader region in our conversation too, um, what lessons uh, for other countries who are still trans struggling to make this transition have those events made in Australia? How did that reverberate through the body politic and how has that changed the debate moving the, forward? The bushfires? Yes, absolutely. Obviously they were terrible, terrible events. You know, um, huge swathes of, of natural Australia destroyed, a billion animals killed, uh, far too many Australians killed, three Americans tragically uh, killed in our bushfires. And of course they reverberated right throughout the country. I was in the middle of the bushfires when they were occurring. Uh, we were evacuated, and I can tell you it, it left its, a big mark on those communities, which is still there now. And of course, now it, I think it's acceptable in Australia to point to the link, I hope everywhere, to point to the link. And there was a time, not that long ago, where you were told, oh, it's the wrong time to, to draw the link between bushfires and climate or floods and climate. Well, when is the right time? When is the right time? And that link has been drawn. And it is correct to say every natural disaster, you know, with the exception, I guess, of earthquakes and volcanoes, but every other natural disaster is going to occur more often and, and be more intense due to climate change. Whether it be floods, which, we, which has equally impacted on Australia recently, 
and we're seeing around the world, or drought, or bushfires, wildfires. Now, in terms of what impact it had in Australia, Charles, material, indeed significant, but I, I think not necessarily determinative. I think the key in the change in Australia has been change, frankly, that the now government um, conducted in the lead up to the election to change the climate change debate from a moral one to an economic one. We ran the case to the Australian people that sure, climate change is a moral imperative, action on climate change is a moral imperative for future generations and internationally to our partners and friends around the world. But even if it wasn't, it's good economic policy. Even if no other country was acting on climate change, on climate change we should because it creates jobs. So for too long, people were able to say, oh, action on climate change might be necessary, but it'll come at the cost of your job. And Australia's only 1% of emissions, so we shouldn't worry. I mean, that argument worked for the best part of 20 years. What we did is model our policies, come up with the policies, have them independently modelled everywhere we went. We talked about the 604,000 jobs created, five out of six in the, in the regions, the more than $70 billion worth of private investment created, the fact that renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy, so it puts downward pressure on power prices. All that was all we talked about. And that was the most effective foil to the argument that action on climate change might be okay, but not if it costs you your job or your children their job or your community's economic future. That was the change. Sure, accompanied with the terrible impact of the bushfires and the floods, but I think that could have occurred and we still wouldn't have had a proper discussion about climate change if we were making the economic case. But, uh, just as President Biden did, you know, he says, I see climate change, I see jobs. We say the world's climate emergency is Australia's jobs opportunity. We're saying the same thing. He won an election, we won an election, both with ambitious climate change policies. Okay, so we have the moral argument. We have the economic argument, uh, but we haven't yet really dug into the foreign policy argument and dimensions of this as well. And uh, I'm hoping that you could talk a little bit more about collaboration uh, with the Pacific Island community specifically. Uh, what actions can Australia take, should Australia be taking along with the United States to convince the Pacific Island community who consistently says that their number one fear, probably their number one, two, and three fears are the existential effects of climate change on their habitations. So where do you see opportunities for us becoming and showing that we are there for the long term and willing to listen to what is an existential risk for this community? Well, I think, Charles, a couple of things, and, and, and they might sound basic because they are, but sometimes the basic things are the important things. One, the engagement. It has been a priority of the new government. You know, b better and deeper engagement in the Pacific has been absolutely central, not only to our foreign policy, but to all of us. We've all, all, all of us in the cabinet, wherever possible, have engaged with the Pacific, including, you know, here in New, in New York, you know, it was Pacific um, leaders that I was spending a fair bit of time with, including in um, the City Energy Forum in July, you know, inviting the Energy Minister of Samoa, for example, and putting him on the top table with, the, with you know, Jennifer Granholm and the Indian Minister and the Japanese Minister, etc. That goes a long way. It's only basic. It's just respect and engagement, but showing them that we care and get it is the essential first step. And with due respect to the previous government who conducted a Pacific step up, which I welcome and endorse and praise, there's no Pacific step up without that action on climate. Nothing else matters. You can step up all you like, but unless you're stepping up on climate, the Pacific's not going to take it seriously. So there's that. Then you can, then you can interact with them on, and have discussions with them about the two other things. What we're doing about our own emissions, and I've had all those discussions, including with former presidents uh, from the Pacific uh, last week, um, and explain to them what we're doing. And it's fair to say, you know, they'll, they will always say, well, let's do more. They will always say, let's do it. But they very much warmly endorse what we are doing. We can talk to them about their own emissions. They're very small emitters in the greater scheme of things. But nevertheless, every, every tonne of carbon dioxide counts. So, We've had discussions with New Zealand, with the United States, and with them about, well, what would, and with IRENA, what would a Pacific-wide emissions reduction scheme look like if, if uh, we wanted to go down that road and involved in those conversations at a you know, very respectful, um, equal level. And then there's the process about adaptation and, and helping them um, prepare, which is an ongoing conversation. But the first point is you've got to recognise the problem. As basic as that sounds, we haven't been doing that up until this point. Uh, can I go a little bit further than that and say, 
when we're recognizing the problem, which your government is doing, as you said, you are engaging, are there initiatives forthcoming uh, about resourcing green climate infrastructure for we, the Pacific? We continue, well, we did go to, yes, we went to the election with, uh, with policies uh, in relation to that about repurposing uh, money for that, and we are going through the process of implementing that, and we'll continue to have further conversations with them about the future. Gotcha. All right, I'd also like to open this up uh, to our audience members. Uh, we've had a lot of conversations today about supply chains, about strategic competition, about climate change and energy policies and where they fit. Uh, and uh, this is such a robust group that if you don't stand up to the microphones, I'm going to cold call. I'm joking, I won't cold call on anyone. Uh, but would you please uh, identify yourself too uh, and ask the question of the minister? Thank you. Hi, Minister. My name's uh, Patty O'Brien. I too come from Sydney and I also have a Labrador. So we have so much in common. I've got two. <laughs> yeah, I wish I had two too. Well, but sometimes anyway, I don't, but anyway. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, welcome to Washington. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I just want to say how absolutely thrilling it is to have a representative of the Australian government uh, presenting uh, this, po these policies on climate change. I can't tell you how refreshing it is um, to, to have that uh, international profile uh, radically changed. Um, so, you know, thank you very much for that. And also, you know, congratulations on your um, climate legislation. You know, you know thank God, right? <laughs> um, but the thing that I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned um, meeting with uh, former presidents uh, Tong and Ramansky last week. Uh, one thing that they talk about, one thing that a lot of people talk about, a lot of the thing that people don't really, the piece of, the, of your policy that doesn't really fit is coal. Like what is the, uh, what is the, the, the road ahead for coal and uh, you know, and, and how does that, what would you say to the Pacific Islands who have a lot of reservations about Australia's uh, coal policies? Sure, I'll tell you what I have said to the Pacific Islands, which is what we need to do is prepare for the future where coal is playing a lesser role. That's what we need to do. And that doesn't require a government decision to come in and say, you know, we are not going to export this coal because 80% of our trading partners are committed to net zero. And so the important thing is to be honest with communities, as I've done from, literally from my first day when I was Shadow Minister for Climate Change and went on the 730 report that night on my first day in the portfolio and said, we have to be honest with communities, coal communities, the world is changing. And we have to prepare for the future. And that means diversifying jobs in coal regions, preparing for the, preparing for, uh, the time when there's less demand for Australian coal. There will be no new coal-fired power stations built in Australia. Uh, as coal-fired power stations close, as, in, as they inevitably will, they will not be replaced with new ones. That's our position. It's not the position of the alternative government. Um, got to be honest about that. And those coal-fired power stations will continue to close, uh, and they're closing at an increasingly rapid rate. We're just, that's just a statement of empirical fact. And so, again, we've got to prepare Australia for the alternative energy, Otherwise, we're going to have an energy supply crunch. We've got to prepare the workers for new jobs, which we're doing, and create those new jobs. So it's about managing that change. And that's what I said to President Tong and, and the other former president. And, um, and they, you know, they, they, they were very understanding of that, except they said, oh, that's the plan. Right? So, of course, of course, you know, there will be a range of views. There are those in the opposition who say, well, we should be building new coal-fired power stations and... Um, we should be, you know, encouraging coal experts. There'll be those who say we should close it all down tomorrow. We have a very pragmatic, realistic and ambitious approach of preparing Australia and coal communities in particular for the future, which means preparing for those alternative jobs. Dr. Jacket. 
Minister Bowen, thank you for your remarks. My name is Jennifer Jackett and I'm from the National Security College at ANU and also the United States Studies Centre. My question is about the intersection of climate change and geopolitics. So we often hear about climate change as one area of potential cooperation with countries like China. Um, but last week in the US we saw green technologies added to some of the export control restrictions and the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan also identified leadership in green tech as a national security imperative. So I'm interested in your view on how you see Australia navigating the need to reduce dependency on countries like China in green tech areas, but also to cooperate on this hugely global problem. Well, th thanks, Jennifer. I think that's a great question. But I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Um, I think you know, we need to be preparing better supply chains, more diverse supply chains, as I said in my remarks. We need to be working with the United States on all those issues. But let me be very, very clear. It would be better too if China and the United States resumed their climate discussions. That, is, that, would be, that would be very welcome. They were recently suspended, okay? We are where we are. When I went to school and somebody got suspended, they came back eventually. Not that I was ever suspended for the record, but, um, <laughs> but I saw it happen to other people. If you were expelled, you were gone forever. A suspension meant you were coming back. The climate talks were suspended. I would, I, it would be a very good thing if they resumed because unless we have the world's two biggest emitters, as proud as I am of the action in Australia, unless the world's two biggest emitters are at least talking, then we are holding one hand behind our back in terms of the effort to get to net zero. So nothing in what I've said or ever would say would indicate that China shouldn't have a role in these discussions. On the contrary, I hope they come to COP ready to engage ready to work together, because the COP will be much more successful. I hope that John Kerry and his counterpart can meet in the lead up to COP. That would lead to a much better outcome. And so, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, dwell on how we got here with a suspension. That is what it is. But we in Australia would very much welcome China back to the table. We don't expect to be at the table in those discussions. That's the United States, Australia matter. We would be at the table with them at COP and G20, and all the other forums, and we would welcome them back to those discussions. So now we have a couple of questions. I would just ask if you have a question, please, to queue up right behind the microphone. Sir. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stephen McGann, and I spent a, quite a bit of time in the region during my State Department career, although as an American, I still consider Mossman my second home. Uh, you mentioned earlier uh, the relationship uh, with Pacific Island countries and others in the region. Uh, and I think that we often, when we think of the Pacific Island countries and climate change, we think of sea level rise. But in actuality, uh, two of the biggest problems in the region happen to be, I, know, I thought I'd turn this off, but I didn't. Uh, two of the biggest problems in the region happen to be uh, workforce engagement and the fact that labor labor remittances uh, take up about 33% of the GMP of Pacific Island countries. Also the fact that uh, dependence on fossil fuels takes up about 50% of their GDPs. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about workforce plans. You already have mechanisms in place to attract Pacific Islanders, but it's not just the Pacific Islanders. Uh, just looking to your north, uh, you have Indonesia, which is under severe uh, climate change stress. Uh, we know that Jakarta is sinking. So migration is going to play an important part of uh, the climate change scenario in the region. So really what I'm trying to get to is as Australia's economy grows, uh, it becomes much more uh, efficient, uh, but it still has engagement in the region, particularly Pacific Island countries and to the north uh, relations with Indonesia. So I was wondering if you can touch upon that just briefly. Well, thank you. I think that's a very fair question. Um, we recently held an Australia Jobs and Skills Summit, you may or may not be aware of. It was a big deal. Um, and migration played a big part. Uh, and clean energy jobs played an equally big part in those discussions. And we've said things about immigration, both permanent and made announcements about permanent immigration, which is obviously across the board, and an appropriate, appropriate place for uh, temporary programs. Um, and that, will, that engagement will continue. Uh, I do note that we've had programs, particularly refer to Indonesia, a country very dear to my heart, um, we've had programs with Indonesia which have often been un undersubscribed. 
um, for the ability of Indonesians to come and work in Australia on a, on a limited basis. Often we've had, you know, we've agreed with the Indonesian government that X spots will be available. And I remember when I was immigration minister, um, I would check and say, how's that Indonesian program going? And they'd say, minister, it's massively undersubscribed. Um, now, we can all sort of discuss what the reasons for that might be and how that might be dealt with. But it's not just a matter of negotiating agreements and saying, let's get X spots here for Indonesia or Malaysia or anyone. There's no point in doing that if people aren't actually coming and taking up the opportunities. I think that's an ongoing conversation. Minister Barbara Miller from the ABC. Uh, the finding by the UN Human Rights Committee on the group on the case brought by the group known as Taurus 8. How significant is that finding? I know you're looking at it, but what might an effective remedy look like? Well, uh, let me just say briefly, Barbara, that um, one of my first acts was to go to the Torres Strait after the election and meet with Torres Strait leaders. I think that's important. I believe I was the first minister to go to the Torres Strait since 2015. Um, these are Australian citizens who deserve to have access to a minister. Since then, also the Prime Minister and the Minister for Indigenous Australians have both been to the Torres Strait. So, you know, we've had more engagement in the last sort of three months than there had been for many years. Uh, the people of the Torres Strait have every right to be concerned. Of course, uh, we need to consider that judgment and work through its implications, which the Attorney General, uh, in consultation with me, will do. Uh, but can I just take this opportunity to express my um, you know, respects to the, in, uh, to the uh, Torres Strait uh, elders whom I've met with uh, and will continue to engage very, very constructively and respectfully with. There is a wave of similar cases throughout the world. Are you concerned that Australia could be hit with further cases? I, I'm not going to start speculating. Welcome, Minister. Jim Caruso, CSIS. Um, to get to the point of so much renewable energy, there's going to need to be a transition. Is it going to be gas? Is it going to be ammonia? And what assurance can you give to investors that they'll have the time necessary to recoup their investments before the renewals kick in? Thanks. Jim, that's a matter for the investors. I mean, I'm not here to provide guarantees. I, 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 like, there are such a thing as a stranded asset, and I, it's not my job to determine what will be a stranded asset and what won't be. I, I have always respected and defended and protected the right of boards and chief executives to make investment decisions based on the best information they have available to it. Not everybody in the federal parliament does. Right? There are those who argue that banks should be for, and insurance companies should be forced to lend to institutions and to insure institutions they don't want to because they don't think it's in their best interests of their shareholders. Call me old fashioned, I believe in a thing called the market. And I believe in boards and senior management's right to make those decisions. And if they make a decision that lending to a particular form of energy is too risky for them because of the energy transition, I respect their right to do that. Um, it's not my, my role to tell them to do it or not to do it or to provide guarantees one way or another. That's for the market to determine. Minister Gordon Flake with the Perth US Asia Centre. Uh, noting that you've got considerable expertise and experience in Indonesia, uh, a dollar spent on, on emissions reductions in Australia uh, has kind of a different return than a dollar spent on emissions reductions in a country like Indonesia. I'm curious as to how you balance the need to ha for Australia to have leadership at home and at the same time the argument that you can be far more productive globally at reducing emissions by spending mother money in partner countries in the region, South Pacific, Indonesia, etc. Uh, I understand where you're coming from, Gordon, but um, and I, I don't disagree with the premise of your question, but I, I think you know, to, to, to think, I'm not suggesting, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but just to be clear, we want Indonesia to succeed in reducing emissions, and I witnessed uh, Fatih Barol and my friend Tarifin Asrif um, release the IEA report into emissions reduction uh, in Indonesia recently. It's an excellent report, and we can engage and assist and help with various elements, which, we've, which I've discussed with uh, Pak Arifin, um, in terms of expertise and assistance. Sure, we can spend money in Indonesia, but you know, the money we can spend is not, gonna, is not gonna be determinative to their outcome. It's private sector money, it's, their, it's, it's Indonesian government money, it's, um, it's uh, other governments together with us, you know, working in partnership. So I don't see it as either or. We've got a, I've established an annual um, energy dialogue, Pakar Finn and I have, um, we'll continue to engage on these issues. We want to see them succeed. But um, I don't think it's a matter of saying, oh, well, we won't spend this money on emissions reduction in Australia. Again, 
Most of the money that will be spent on emissions reduction in Australia is private sector investment. We'll provide the framework for it. And some government expenditure is, of course, necessary. Arena, CFC, Powering the Regions Fund, we've got them. But that's not going to do the job. It's unleashing those billions of dollars of private sector investment. And you know that can be unleashed in Australia and Indonesia and anywhere and everywhere and has to be. I am somewhat mindful of the minister's time because we're all having this great conversation, but he has a plane ride uh, to catch soon. Let me see. Don't uh, delay if, me getting to Sydney. Uh, are we okay? Does anyone have any final questions for the minister? With that, I'm going to thank you for your time. I'm going to make sure that you get on your airplane and go back there. And thank you for taking the time to divert from Pittsburgh to come join us here today. Pleasure. You're the only resident I'm in Washington. That's how much I like you. Well, safe travels home. Good on you. Thank you. Cheers.